the creation of the Freedom Caucus even in DC is is relatively new. When when state reps were coming to you guys saying, I wish we had a Freedom Caucus, why were they saying that? What did they have in mind that that would provide aid and help with? So here's the thing about state politics that a lot of people don't know is um, their sessions are short. Mm-hmm. Like in some states, it's only a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And so these are part-time lawmakers. They're citizen lawmakers. Um, and they have zero resources. They don't have staff. They don't have an office. Like so in some states, their desk on the House floor, that's their office. <laughs> and so they have zero resources. So if they want to um, know what a bill does, they have to read it. And if they don't have time, then they have to ask leadership and their staff about what this bill does. And so all the incentives are wrong. Um, now, the flip side of that is that the establishment at the state level has tons of resources, right? The governor is full-time. The, the governor has um, uh, lawyers, consultants, comms team. They have everything they need. The lobbyists have all they need. They've got all the money, the contacts, everything. Leadership in the state legislatures, they have everything they need. Who doesn't have anything? The people that are defending our rights. Mm -hmm. And they have nothing. So we wanted to level the playing field a little bit and just give them all the resources they need to succeed. And the other thing is that nobody knows what's going on in the state capitals. Whenever you turn on the TV, it's all about D.C. It's all about the speaker fight or the debt ceiling fight. But nobody knows what's happening in Cheyenne, Wyoming, or Boise, Idaho. And that's exactly how the establishment wants it. They want to be in the dark. Most people don't know who their state rep or their state senator is. And so that's a perfect atmosphere for very bad things to happen. But if we set up state freedom caucuses, then we give them the tools they need to fight. They have each other. And one of the things we teach them is be very, very loud. And when you do that, then people start realizing who their state rep is and their state senator, and they get engaged. And then the magic starts to happen after that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that that one of the reasons there's this imbalance is, is that they don't have staff. It's very politically unpopular. But do you think that these members should should have a budget to be able to hire staff? Do you think it would it would be, you know, worth the money, so to speak, in terms of the overall fiscal situation in these I, states? I think so. I mean, that would definitely help. Um, what uh, the Freedom Caucuses provide, though, is accountability to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, just like in D.C., the State Freedom Caucuses, they have bylaws, uh, and it's an accountability document to keep the colleagues accountable to each other. And if they have staff and if they have support from our national group, then you're getting everything that you're supposed to be mm-hmm. getting. So even though I think tax dollars would be good to give them staff, they need to have that constant mm-hmm. accountability with each mm-hmm. other. That's when it really makes a difference. So w- walk me through, you know, a day in the life of or, you know, what the ecosystem of these state reps is like, because, again, people barely even understand what what the day of a member of Congress in D.C. is like. Right. I promise you it's not them reading bills and, you know writing legislation it's uh it's you know a lot of other things they're citizen legislatures so it's it's sort of definitionally not their entire job um but what's the environment that these state reps are operating in look like yeah i mean a day in the life of a state rep is they're at home doing their full-time job Mm -hmm. and dealing with their families Mm -hmm. so they're not plugged in fully like members of Congress are. Mm -hmm. Um, And as I mentioned before, their sessions are very short. Sometimes it's only two months, three months. But when they do get into the Capitol, um, first of all, these are not professional politicians either. Mm -hmm. They don't know the policy in depth. And I know a lot of people in Congress don't know the policy Mm -hmm. either, but they have staff to help them, right? Mm -hmm. But if certificate of need or occupational licensing, if one of those policies comes up in a bill, these folks don't know those issues mm-hmm. in and out. Um, and if you don't have any staff, then you totally don't know what you're voting mm-hmm. for. And so we see even the best lawmakers, the best conservative lawmakers at the state level, they cast a lot of bad votes. And it's not because they're squishy or liberal or part of the establishment. It's because they simply don't know. And so us just helping them read the bills and analyze them and educate them, their voting records absolutely transform overnight. And that's just by telling them, you know, talking to them about the bills. 
um, let alone bringing them together and actually being a, a force of good on strategy and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So describe to me, you know, some of the forces that are causing the pain here. So what, what does the lobbying ecosystem around a state legislature look like? Yeah, I mean, in session, the, um, you know, a lot of uh, capitals, the lobbyists have floor access. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also um, that, that means they get to be in and among the members uh, you know, at their desks. Yeah. Well, not, not when they gavel in. But yeah, they're, they're hanging around. Um, and then also uh, Ledge Council or LSO, the, there's different names, but it's the, the group of staff that write the bills mm -hmm. that, that, that help you write the bills. Mm -hmm. They're fully funded by the leadership. And so if you are a conservative lawmaker and you go up to them and say, hey, I want to um, offer a bill to um, remove all DEI out of the, the colleges in our state, they will then alert leadership mm -hmm. and then they will say, no, that's, that's not a good idea or that's mm -hmm. unconstitutional. And most state lawmakers before we came on board would say, oh, OK, I guess I won't do that then. Yeah. Uh, so there are all these incentives that just totally work against us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 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 amazing what we've been able to do. Not not me or anybody else at the national level, but just providing a little bit of support and mm -hmm. services to state lawmakers goes a long way. It's huge. Uh, talk to me about the incentives around media. You know, almost all these state capitals have a set of media outlets that are covering yeah. what's going on. Um, how how does that end up pressuring or supporting or putting countervailing force on these these members? That's a great question because the the leadership establishment infrastructure totally dominates the media. Mm -hmm. um, they leak stories. They frame the narratives. They they do everything. And our folks, they don't even know how to deal with the media and if they get burned even once then they just shut down and don't talk to the media at all and so you've got one narrative coming out of the media which mm -hmm. is the leadership establishment narrative mm -hmm. and no conservative narrative so we flip that and we give them media training we tell them how to talk to print journalists how to talk to uh, tv journalists radio all of that mm -hmm. and we t teach them how to properly leak uh information uh, and by doing that, you put the leadership on their heels almost immediately. So obviously, it'd be preferable to have a, a conservative outlet in, in each of these states. But, you know, there's only so many problems you can solve at once. Right. It, it, talk to me just a little because, you know, that's something that I, I can easily just practically hear the response. It's like, oh, I, I shouldn't talk to the mainstream press. Can't cooperate with the lying fake news media. How, how do you make that argument to someone who's 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 resistant to it? What's what's the get, get, paint a picture for me for what valuable thing can be done if they if they do this right? They, they can do all sorts of things. One is, um, well, overarching all of this is that they need to be loud. It's not good enough to just vote conservatively. You have to make people aware mm -hmm. of what kind of mm -hmm. um, garbage is, is happening in the state mm -hmm. capitol. So we make sure that they use Facebook and Twitter extensively. Um, the the one thing that they do is the one thing that we teach is that Facebook is to reach out to your constituents. Twitter is used to reach out to the media mm -hmm. or to make the media aware. So just skip the mainstream media and just go directly to the people through social media. And then also um, floor speeches, committee speeches, make sure that you capture those on video and get them out to the people and just make them aware. And we also use Substack where uh, each of our Freedom Caucuses have an email list, and every time something happens, they need to blast it out and go directly to the voters. And that makes a huge difference. Now, that doesn't mean that we completely ignore traditional media. You still have to talk to them, and you still have to get out there. Um, but at the state level, radio is the, the, the big thing. So we tell them to do as much radio as possible. Are these radio hosts just as susceptible to the establishment narratives I've, I've seen that a couple times where it's like it's like they're getting some sort of memo and they end up pressing the freedom caucus member with questions that sound like they could come straight out of the speaker of the house's mouth yeah there there are conservative hosts and they are very good allies mm -hmm. but then there are some that do exactly like you say which are just mouthpieces for the establishment mm -hmm. um, but we just tell them that if you don't put out your narrative then the establishment wins. Yeah. So whatever you do, whether it's engaging with a hostile reporter or with a friendly reporter, you just have to get out there. Um, that's the key. 